do what? Let's just get that hand clap unto the Lord, shall we? I consider it an exceptionally high honor to be asked to preach here, or to, well, to, to, to teach, but uh, sometimes when I teach, a preaching anointing comes on me. Sometimes when I'm preaching, a teaching anointing comes on me. I'm just going to feel after the will of the Lord this evening. Praise the Lord. It's good to see everyone here. Um, I give honor to uh, Bishop Wilson, who's not here, and to Pastor Boskis. Uh, but when we talk about giving honor to the ministry, we're all ministers. We all have received the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. We're all ambassadors for Christ. Amen. We all have a place and a part to play in the church. God has placed us in his church. Amen. But you all are standing, and let's, if we will, let's go ahead and let's turn to... Uh, the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. And then we're going to turn to Acts, chapter 19, verses 11 and 20. The good presence of the Lord here tonight. I, I kind of want to tarry in that, but I know we're, this is a Wednesday night. We've worked hard. We're, we're, we're tired. Um, but I just kind of want to launch right into this. Uh, Chapter, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the words of Jesus, talking about what's going to happen a few days later. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and even in Potts Camp, Mississippi, the uttermost part of the earth. Amen. And then Acts chapter 19, verses 11 through 20, and I apologize, this is a lengthier reading. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, uh, and the evil spirits went out of them, the handkerchief, the apron. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, and overcame them and prevailed. Everyone say prevailed, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. That must have been quite a sight to behold. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Aren't you glad today his name is still magnified? We are a people who magnify his name. Amen. I'm wrapping this up. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts, that's the occult, horoscopes, astrology, new age, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Verse 20, this is where we're going to land on. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Everyone again say, prevailed. Amen. Let's all set our Bibles down. Let's just talk to the Lord one more time. Mighty God, we love you, we thank you, we praise you, God, that you're a wonderful, loving, merciful Savior to us, that you have endued your church with power, with the Holy Ghost. Lord, I ask that you help me to speak this evening. Let me speak as, the, as your oracle, God. Help us to hear God with spiritual ears, a spiritual understanding, Lord. And help us all in your holy name, Jesus. Everyone said, in Jesus' name, amen. Y'all may be seated, but let's just clap one more time to the Lord as we're seated. I got quite a shock this evening. I asked um, Brother Hughes, you know, 
help me out with the ropes. I did not want to bother Brother Vasquez because I knew he was busy and tied up. I said, how long does, how long do you do, 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 do Sunday, does the, 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 the class last? He says, oh, 40, 45 minutes. I'm used to speaking maybe 20 to 25 minutes, and Lord willing, if my voice holds out, we'll get there maybe 30 minutes, praise the Lord. If it doesn't, we'll just have a testimony service, hallelujah. But let me kind of go a little bit more into me so you all know a little bit more. So, now, of course, many of you all already know who I am, and you know me by virtue of my sweet wife, Sister Pam. Um, who's no stranger to you. She actually graduated from BCS. I'm not going to say exactly when. Uh, but at any rate, I come from an, an interesting background. Let me just give a very brief testimony. I, I grew up in the Detroit area in Michigan, came from a Catholic background, left the church as a teenager, which was a very good thing to leave the church. Uh, got involved in the born again Christian movement in college received the baptism of the Holy Ghost by myself in a dorm room. I wish I could pinpoint the date, but it would have been sometime around 1978 or 79. I was baptized in the only name we're supposed to be baptized in, praise the Lord, in 1988 down in Philadelphia. But before that happened, I had actually come down to go to law school, and I appreciate the fact that Brother Tucker is already... Uh, borne the brunt of, of, of being a lawyer here. He's kind of uh, uh, smoothed the path, praise God. But um, <clears throat> I came down here to go to law school, and in between semesters, I would notice this beautiful, exotic-looking girl walking across the campus. This is the, this is the late 1980s, so you have to understand and, 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 and realize what the fashions were back then. They're a little different than they are now. She had this long, flowing black hair and a poof. Some of you all may remember what those are. And she always wore dresses or skirts that came down past her knees. She looked like she was from another planet, honestly, but she was beautiful. And I was convinced that she was a foreign student. I was convinced that she was from... Uh, uh, the Middle East or Spain or Italy or whatever. And so one day I built up the courage to approach her on the steps of the library there on campus. I said, hi, my name is Larry. And I was shocked to hear her say, hi, my name is Pam. <laughs> so, <laughs> praise the Lord. But the rest, as they say, is history. And um, I knew nothing about uh, the apostolic, even though I'd had the Holy Ghost and it had some brief uh, encounters with apostolic folks up in Michigan. I really knew nothing about, about, about uh, this, this apostolic truth, uh, this wonderful faith that we have. And um, she invited me to church at the time she was going to Blue Mountain. So I'm pleased to say it's interesting how things come full circle. The preacher that preached the first message I ever heard in an apostolic church is sitting here with us tonight. And that's you, Brother Carson. I don't remember a whole lot about the message, but I can remember you banging on the podium talking about Jesus uh, knock, uh, knocking on the doors of our heart, praise God. But churches have a culture. And uh, at that time in Blue Mountain's history, uh, they took me first into the men's prayer room. Now, I had I'd had the Holy Ghost. I had had dealings with charismatics back then. I'd been to prayer meetings, but I'd never heard such deep, travailing prayer in my life. Frankly, I didn't know what to make of it. I thought someone was dying or had died. But it was just intercessory prayer, praise God. And that made a huge impact on me. And then the second impact was the friendliness of the young men there. They were genuinely interested in me and knowing about me. It was uh, Brother Joe Street's sons. I don't know if you remember Joe Street. Uh, Brother uh, uh, John Martindale, if, I, if that was his name, and, and others. And that made a huge impact on me. And, of course, I remember the message. And I sensed, Brother Carson, that you were reaching out to me. 
But uh, of course, at the time, I was still kind of stiff-necked. But eventually, I, I received the revelation. You know, this doesn't come through logic or intellect. We didn't get into the church. We did not repent of our sins or be baptized in the name of Jesus or receive the Holy Ghost because of logic or because of the intellect of men. It came by way of revelation. And that's the only way it works, praise God. That's why, while I appreciate uh, building programs, and, 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 and I certainly appreciate home Bible studies, we have to realize that getting folks in church, if we look back at what happened to us, it's a spiritual process. Because if the gospel be hid, it is hid uh, to those whose eyes are blinded by the God of this world. So it's a spiritual process. Anyways, praise the Lord. Um, I, uh, uh, so uh, Pam and I eventually married, and uh, uh, she is the, uh, the daughter of, of Bishop Eugene Taylor. And we moved back from Philadelphia, Mississippi, started attending church briefly in, in uh, Oxford, and then her daddy was uh, voted in as pastor at West Pontotoc in, I think, October of 89. And we attended faithfully there from December of uh, uh, 1990 up until recently feeling a urge, a, a turn, a, a change of direction from the Lord. We, 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 we prayed about it. We laid out a fleece. The fleece was answered, praise God, and we're here today. We're here. We're, I, I, I'm so happy to be speaking at a church that appreciates preaching, that appreciates the preached word of God. Mm. because nothing else will save us. But I came up under Bishop Eugene Taylor, and uh, if, if, you, if, if you know him, he is among the best of the best, a total class act. Uh, but he instilled in me a love and a respect and a reverence for the Word of God. And he is what would be known as a word preacher. He has tremendous spiritual depth, but he is a word preacher, which means you preach a message and there, it may be a dead service, but that word does not return void. It never does. It always achieves its, its intended purpose, praise God. Anyways, let's fast forward um, and see where we're going to go with this, praise God. I understand this is a teaching. Um, uh, uh, these are designed to be teaching. I'll try to do that. I know I've got huge shoes. I'm not even going to try to fill. I asked Brother Vasquez when he asked me, uh, well, you know, do y'all do y'all teach from a book? He said, no. He said, I've been teaching on the book of Acts, but feel your liberty to, to teach uh, and speak on whatever you want to. And I thought, well, I'm comfortable talking about the book of Acts and teaching out of the book of Acts because we are a book of Acts church. Amen. We are a book of Acts church. And it, what's interesting, Brother Carson, is I've been preaching um, at, at West Potatoc primarily for, for close to 30 years and then became, was asked to become the adult Sunday school teacher maybe five, six years ago, I can't remember, and uh, uh, then was asked to serve as a uh, assistant or co-pastor. And, um, but when you put together a message, you, of course, you study the Word of God, but you have to hear from God. We have to be so sensitive to His voice. And I would get messages, and I would preach. I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm, gonna, I'm making a point. And, you know, I'd go to YouTube, and, and, and on my YouTube feed, this you know, Bethlehem church would come up, and to my amazement, I would see maybe a week or two after, Brother Vasquez had preached a message on the same subject. And what that simply means is God is aligning all of his churches together. He's, he's putting us all on the same page. We talk about unity within the church. We talk about unity within the local congregation. And that's an important thing. Of course, unity starts within myself. I have to become aligned with the Spirit of God. And then it flows outward to my brothers and sisters in the local congregation. But God is more about than just unity within the local congregation. He's trying to achieve unity amongst the, 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 the worldwide church. And this thing is a lot bigger than you think it is. 
It's a lot bigger than you think it is. Praise God. A um, couple of more points uh, as, as a preface. Uh, you're looking at someone that's into conspiracy theories. And when COVID hit in, in early um, 2000, of course, like everyone else, I was wondering, what's going on? What is this? We were seeing, un we don't want to really remember, but if you go put your mind back and you were into sports or entertainment, you were seeing things shut down. The institutions, the money-making things of the world were being shut down one after another. And that is, I'm 64 years old. That's un that was unprecedented in my lifetime and probably unprecedented in the history of this country other than World War II. And, and you're seeing all this stuff and then you're hearing reports about the, the bio lab in Wuhan and, and so forth. And Brother Tucker, one day, I think it was March of 2000, I'm sitting in my office, well, I'm sitting in the, in the law library of our office. Uh, it was a client's deposition. And you know those can be boring. It's, if, you, if you prep your client, you can just, you, you, everyone goes on uh, uh, auto cruise, although you kind of make sure the opposing attorney does not uh, uh, you know, ask a, a question he shouldn't ask. And I was just thinking about all this stuff. What is going on? And oh, you know, is it, is it a, a bio-attack from, from China? Is, 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 are they trying to bring down the Trump administration? And all of a sudden, I heard so clearly, not audibly, but clearly, the voice of the Lord speak to me. And he told me, stop listening to conspiracy theories. Everything you need to know is in my book. Everything we need to know, everything we need to get saved by is in his book. Amen. We worship you, mighty God. So, another impression, and again, this will bring me up to where I want to talk about. I, I know I'm kind of meandering. Um, we, I do tend to go down rabbit holes. But the first part of this year, I felt impressed to the Lord as, as, we came, as we emerged from the pandemic and all the weirdness, and, and we're still dealing with weirdness in, 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 in the world, trying to make sense of it, I became very impressed that what God had done was allowed COVID to come into our lives for a specific purpose, and that was to reorient us to becoming the Book of Acts church. Amen. Not, everybody, not everyone wants to be the Book of Acts church. Not every church behaves in accordance with the Book of Acts and so forth. But I believe that's what the, the, I believe that's what the Lord wants us to become. He is restoring things and he's bringing about, so he can bring about a latter rain that's going to be greater than anything we've ever seen. Can someone say amen? All right. The Book of Acts uh, is actually titled the Acts of the Apostles. And so you have to understand that we, we, we call ourselves apostolic because we take our doctrine from, from, from the apostles. And there's a uniqueness to that, uh, that, 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 that that's tremendous. Uh, now, the church, of course, we see things happening in, in, in the book of Acts that involve ordinary people uh, and not just the apostles. But we have to understand that the, the, the apostles and the foundation they laid, doctrinally speaking, was so important that the 12, that we're all, where are we heading to? Where are we wanting to head to? A heavenly city called the New Jerusalem, right? How many foundations does that city, city have? It's a city with foundations, as the Hebrew says. How many foundations does that city have? 12. And what are the names of those foundations? The 12 apostles. That's how important it is to understand that our, you know, we, we can get uh, disrespected or razzed by people saying we put too much emphasis on the apostles. Hey, God, God puts emphasis on the apostles. Praise the Lord. So anyways, um, so the, 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 the church explodes on the day of Pentecost. But there's a precedent for that. 
I had read Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Everyone in here is called to be that witness. Amen. Now, when the Holy Ghost fell in that upper room, it's interesting to me that it was almost a, a storm. It was a, it was a weather storm, a meteorological phenomena, a mighty rushing wind. It filled the house. Remember, God filled the, 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 the temple, his house that Solomon built. God is interested in filling empty houses, houses that become yielded and empty to him. He's interested and desires to fill us with that wind, praise God. Hallelujah. But Peter, now the church was born in the midst of skepticism. It was born in the midst of ridicule. When they come out of that upper room, they, 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 they mock them, they say they're drunk, they recognize something that looked like inebriation. And it's interesting that Peter doesn't say these are not, they're not drunk. He didn't say, no, they're not drunk. He said, they're not drunk as you suppose. And he tells them, he explains to them, he's going back to Joel, the, prof, the, uh, the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. But I don't believe, this is Brother Larry, but I don't believe it even starts there. I know Peter cites Joel, but if you go back even earlier to the man uh, Jews today considered to be the greatest prophet, in Numbers chapter 11, Moses talking to Joshua says, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and the Lord would put his spirit upon them. I believe that God heard that cry, that prayer. There maybe have been something prophetic in it. And here we are, centuries later, filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now let me talk about the book of Acts because there's a lot of stuff out there in the world about it. People try to discount it. People say it's simply a history. It, it, it takes the form of a narrative. Luke is the... Is, is, is the is the scribe, you might say. He's the secretary writing it, but God is the one who's inspiring it. And it takes the form of a, a narrative, but it's not merely history. You could look at the Bible in many different ways. It's, it's God's love letter to the church. And by the way, I'm going to say something that may sound radical. This book is only for God's people. I didn't hear a whole lot of amens. This book is only for God's people. The gospel is for everyone. The gospel is for whosoever shall believe. I understand it. The blood was shed for everyone. But this book belongs to us. God wrote this book for a people called after his name. It's for us. Amen. You understand it's, it's, a, it's a road map and a manual to help us get from heaven to earth. I mean, from earth to heaven. It's, it's a love letter. It's, it's, it's actually, it's the very embodiment of God himself. This is a living word. I can't quote the writer right now, but someone once wrote, when you're reading the Bible, when you're reading God's word, God's word is reading you. There is tremendous power in this word. I like what Brother Vasquez said the other night. We don't have to necessarily preach signs, wonders, and miracles, although we believe that because we're a supernatural church. All we have to do is talk about one God and his name being Jesus, and those things will happen. Amen. Jesus always gets the preeminence. But when you put the word in its proper place, and you understand the supreme importance of the word, that's mind-blowing. David said, show me wondrous things out of your law. Basically, he, he didn't have the full Bible. He had maybe the first five books uh, uh, of the Bible, the Pentateuch. But what he's saying, what he realized is there's mind-blowing things in God's word, but we've got to search them out. We've got to dig deep and get them. God will speak to us through his word. Amen. Praise the Lord. We worship you, God. Hallelujah. But if the Bible is our book, the book of Acts is our chapter. And again, it's not merely history. 
Uh, let, let me read what, uh, from the Apostolic Study Bible, and I apologize if I'm getting kind of didactic, but let me, let me read this. Uh, and by the way, if you're interested, uh, I'm going to give away a trade, trade secret here. I got this. It's falling apart. It didn't last very well a few years ago. It's known as the Apostolic Study Bible. It's put out by um, or was sponsored by the uh, uh, WPF, which is a, uh, a oneness uh, apostolic organization uh, that was made up of ministers such as that, that, that broke away from the UPCI after they voted on the television thing. It's, it was formed by folks such as uh, Brother Larry Booker and Johnny Godare. And But interestingly enough, one of the contributors, one of the main editors is a, a UPC pastor. But it's got great stuff in here. But let me just read this. It says, the book of Acts is the sole authoritative prototype for the church in any period of its history. It reveals the church in its most optimal, optimal, optimal form, both doctrinally and dynamically, in word and spirit. Anything within the local church or the church in general that is at variance with what is revealed in Acts and the New Testament, let me read that again. Anything within the local church or the church in general that is at variance with what is revealed in Acts and the New Testament is spurious, defective, or heretical. That means, I understand we come from different backgrounds. If we didn't grow up in this, I'm a first-generation first, first generation, uh, apostolic. I recognize they're a good Church of Christ people. I recognize they're a good Baptist. I recognize they're, they're good uh, uh, Catholics. But they are in heresy. That, that just got real quiet here. They are in heresy. We've got to readjust our thinking and our mindset. For too long, we've been on the other side of the tracks. We've known, we've, we've we kind of realized some people call us a cult. Uh, some people uh, regard us as, as, as weirdos. We're not the cult. All these other folks are the cult. I, I, I know what a cult looks like. I, have, I had encounters with a cult up in Michigan. I dated a girl from a wealthy background who got hooked into a cult. Her dad had to hire one of these deprogrammers to get her out, and she was messed up afterwards. We're not the, we are the church of the living God. We are his universal church. And I say all that to say that there is going to be a falling away, unfortunately. There's going to be, God himself is going to put strong delusion on people. You know what's real sobering? I've got to be careful what the desires of my heart are because God will give me the desires of my heart, good, bad, or whatever. So I've got to make sure my heart is lined up with God. Amen. I know. I'm, I'm rambling. I'm rambling. But, but this is how I put it as far as how I view the book of Acts. If you've ever had to put together a piece of equipment, a lawnmower, uh, some type of farming implement, uh, maybe a piece of furniture, you'll get a set of instructions, and there will be written instructions. And sometimes the written instructions may only take you so far. You're, you know, you're scratching your head, and you say, well, how does this bolt go here, or, or what do I do with this, or whatever. But some companies will actually also include a illustrated diagram that shows you how to put the thing together. Can I submit the book of Acts is that illustration. You know, some companies that, are, that, that, that have find more uh, resources will actually include a DVD or in the old days a VHS and you can sit and watch how the thing gets put together to help you put it together. That is what the book of Acts is for us. Amen. It's, it's uh, 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 now we don't put the church together. Hear me. God created the church. He puts it together. He places us. But we have to learn about its operation, how it's supposed to operate, how we operate in it, how God operates within his church. Because at some point in time, way down the road, we, this no longer is simply the church. We become his bride. Amen. And he's going to take a bride that's without spot or blemish. 
So we've got to get it right this go around. Amen. The teaching and, and really the doctrinal importance of the book of Acts is actually found in the very first chapter and in the very, uh, very first verse of the first chapter and the very last verse of the last chapter. In the uh, book of Acts starts off with uh, uh, Luke stating, uh, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus. By the way, that means a friend of God or a lover of God. I think I'm talking to some folks tonight that are friends of God and are lovers of God. Amen. Of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Everyone say teach. And the very final verse which, re which uh, records Paul in Rome, quote, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, that means boldness, uh, uh, no man forbid forbidding him. So teaching is so important to God, he bookends the book of Acts, first verse and the very last verse. Someone say amen. Now, we do know that we're a supernatural people. We believe in a supernatural God. This is a supernatural church. And the reason why that is, is because the word of God was allowed to prevail. Amen. Um, the early church was explosive in its evangelical growth, but that growth was never cut off from or independent of the operation of the spirit in the working of miracles, signs, and wonders. But that occurred because the word was allowed to prevail. And we see in the book of Acts that evangelism and growth goes hand in hand with the miraculous, the spiritual, supernatural working. Uh, in Mark chapter 16, there's a foretaste of that. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. God's word in those early days grew in an environment of spiritual ignorance, religious hostility. There were Christian wannabes. There was tremendous demonic activity. But the word of God in that early church prevailed over and against all those things. Prevailed against sickness, demonic possession, spiritual darkness, and blindness. So we got to ask, is the word of God prevailing and growing in our lives? Amen. You know, we talked, the verses talk about the sons of Sceva. You know, it may come as a surprise, but the name of Jesus isn't going to just work for anybody. We call on the name of Jesus for salvation. It'll work for everybody there, everybody who's of a contrite heart. But as far as the operation, the spiritual operation of the church, it only operates for those who have the name of Jesus. So, you know, the wannabes, the fakes, the posers, and so on, you can't fool the devil. People know when you're operating in power and when you're not, and they need the real thing. Amen. A couple more verses, and I may just wrap this up. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm short-winded. I, I, we may just have an altar service. We'll see. But David wrote, I will worship toward thy holy temple. This is the 138th Psalm, verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name. David had a revelation of the name of God. He said, I will praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. Aren't you grateful for the truth? Aren't you glad you've received the love of the truth? We're grounded with that love of the truth. Amen. But then he finishes it. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Brother Carson, Bishop Taylor used to preach that all the time, and I'd scratch my head because we know how important the name of Jesus is. We are commanded to do everything in the name of Jesus. We bless our food in the name of Jesus. We pray over the sick in the name of Jesus. We get baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Yet the verse here, and this is, this is the word, saying that I have magnified thy word above all thy name. Because where the name refers to a person, we know from John 1 and 1 that the word is that person. So the word stands as a backing and a guarantee and a surety for the operation of the names. Can someone say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you, mighty God. Um, let me kind of finish this up here. 
I, I have to, I've mentioned this before. Acts 2.38 is not our foundational verse. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and 4 should be our, our foundational verse. Oh, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Amen. But what Acts 2.38 is our foundational verse for salvation. But what Acts 2.38 does, it gets us into the church. Obedience to Acts 2.38 gets us into the church. And we've got to be very careful. Brother Larry is very sensitive to things that try to creep into a church, that try to creep into the body, that try to corrupt. Uh, I, I don't know if God has called me to be a gatekeeper, but I'm very sensitive to that stuff. And we've got to be careful that we don't incorporate once saved, always saved into Acts 2.38. It gets you into the church, but on the very last day of our lives, whether we die or we're raptured, we've got to remain in the church. That's why I appreciate what Bishop Wilson said the other night, Friday night, about it, quoting his grandson. Repent. Be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Receive the Holy Ghost. Live holy. We're called to live holy. It may seem like it's getting harder and harder, but to me it's getting easier and easier because the lines are so clearly getting drawn and what's going on in the world. Praise God. Let me finish up here. How, how long have I been? Has anyone been keeping track of the time? Am I too short? <laughs> You all tell Brother Voss because you didn't get your money's worth tonight if I'm too short, praise God. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to look around and, and realize a lot of things are amiss. We, we live in a crooked and perverse generation, as Peter put it, and we're to save ourselves from this untoward generation. That word untoward means perverse. I'm, I'm 64 years old. And um, I came up during the space age, the, the, the space race between the United States and Russia, or the, it was the Soviet Union back then. And would be glued to the television. If some of y'all preach against TV, I apologize. Don't mean to be offend, offensive. But I'd be glued to the television set whenever there'd be a, a rocket launch, whether it was the Mercury uh, space program or the, or the Gemini or Apollo. I mean, it was a big deal back then. Now, who knows what's going on? They could launch a rocket and no one, you know, no one really follows it, but it was a national event and it drew people together. And I can remember they would, they would show uh, on television, you'd, you'd see the rocket on the launching pad and then they, they pan and they show scenes of mission control in Houston. And a phrase that they used has been coming to my mind more and more. And some of you who may have watched that will remember this. It's just become etched in my mind. But you'd have the NASA flight engineer start the countdown. T minus five minutes and counting. Booster set to go. T minus four minutes and 25 seconds. Do y'all remember that? Maybe not. Maybe I'm the only one. I went back to YouTube. I, 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 this, this afternoon, I Googled the Apollo 11 uh, uh, moon, moon launch just to make sure my memory had not been playing games on me. Then they get closer to the launch. T minus two minutes and 45 seconds and counting. T meaning time minus. And you get down and that, that the uh, control director, the engineer, T minus one minute and 25 seconds and counting. And then T minus 45 seconds and counting. But then Brother Carson, they'd get to 12. And it was no longer T minus, it was 12, 11, 10, 
nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Can I tell this church tonight, I believe with all my heart, we're past the T-minus stage. We're in the final countdown of this thing. Let's all stand. If we, if we all, could we all just stand for a moment? Mighty God, we love you. We thank you. We praise your holy name. We worship you, Jesus. We love you. We need you, God. I, I wasn't expecting to make an altar call, but I feel deep concern tonight that there may be someone here who doesn't really have both feet in the church. You can't be saved outside of the church. And this countdown, we're in the final stages of the countdown. We are in the final stages of the countdown when God is going to take his church out of here. Oh, I know. oh they've been saying that for centuries, Brother Larry. No, sir. No, ma'am. We are in the final stages of the countdown. It doesn't mean we hunker down. We've got to work while there's still day. The night's approaching when no man can work. The church is going to be out of here. We can't work when we're gone. It's so important tonight that we make sure we are fully in the church. Let's all lift our hands right now. Where you are, let's just talk to the Lord. Mighty God, we love you. We thank you. We praise your holy name, God. Lord, speak to your people tonight, God. Lord, I know you love your people. You love us all, God. You've loaded us down with benefits today, God. You don't want to see anyone saved. You don't even want to see the wicked and the unrighteous destroyed, God. Lord, you've placed gifts in your church. You've placed safeguards in your church, God. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us a church, God, that we can be saved within. We thank you for your word. We're washed by the washing of the water of the word. Hallelujah. We thank you for your blood. We thank you for the protective covering that your blood has provided. We thank you, Jesus, for this wonderful truth you've given us, this apostolic doctrine, God. Let us always be zealous and jealous and protective of it, oh God. Lord, we worship you. We thank you and praise you, mighty God. I tell you what, why don't we just start talking to the Lord? Why don't we just praise the Lord for a moment? Let's give him about 30 seconds of apostolic praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We praise your holy name, God. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Ibrana karesire yatala de yatorotohosa. Ikarra mahashe yatala maha. Yes, oh God. Yes, oh God. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Shout out his name. Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise your holy name, oh God. I don't know how I'll stand, and I don't know who to hand the mic off to, but I can tell. Let's do this. Does anyone here need special prayer? I, I think, is this the anointing oil up here? Okay. Does anyone need prayer? Uh, there are ministers here. We pray for you. It's one more time. Let's just... Shout out to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Lord, we love you and we thank you and praise your holy name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your holy name, Lord. God bless you all.